Glorioso Miranda, one and a half years for General Emmanuel Bautista. By the way, we invited him under the regime of uh, uh, President Arroyo. Uh, we had, uh, she had uh, 12 appointees and uh, they had uh, a Benji Defensor of the Air Force for two months. And uh, General Hermoenes Espiron, currently National Security Advisor, who served 1.9 years. Under the regime of President Estrada, uh, in less than three years, there was uh, General Joselito Nazareno, who served one year, and uh, General Angelo Reyes, the late uh, Secretary of Defense himself, uh, I'm sorry, local government, I believe, for one and a half years. And under President Ramos, who was a soldier himself, uh, he, uh, he had uh, General Clemente Mariano for six months, one year for General Arnulfo Acedera. And of course, uh, <coughs> the rest, uh, we have General Rodolfo de Villa under Cory Aquino, who served three years uh, as, a, as a chief of staff of the armed forces. So you can see that the, 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 <coughs> there's been a practice of a revolving door in the appointment of the chief of staff of the AP which I believe is very inimical to public interest because it hinder, hinders uh, some basic principles of continuity and stability uh, and consistency in the leadership of our armed forces, the protectors of our country, uh, of the citizens, and allow, and, uh, and should, should allow for political, and then this, this uh, creates a situation which uh, allows for political accommodation promotion that favors personalities over the security and <laughs> so uh, further, uh, the, the person of the AP should be given ample time and secured the tenure to develop, test and implement effective reforms and meaningful long-term plans and programs to strengthen and modernize the armed forces of the Philippines. It is imperative not only for the chief of staff, but also for the key officers, such as the major service commanders, uh, who shall form the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Uh, and these are the Joint Forces Commanders of the Unified Commands, the Commandant of the Philippine Marine Corps, the Commandant of the Commander of the Special Operations Command, the Commander of Cybersecurity Command, and the Superintendent of the Philippine Military Academy under this proposal. Uh, these key officers constitute the core leadership of the Armed Forces of the Philippines, or hold uh, who should hold positions that require specialized skill and expertise that must have been given time, in other words, to ripen into maturity and uh, uh, solidness insofar as leadership is concerned. Perhaps if I may, uh, we've seen a number of incidents, and I don't blame it right, uh, right away, uh, upon uh, some of the young generals in our country, but recently we've seen uh, a parcel of ambushes. Uh, some of our soldiers were killed, some in the dozens, some in less than 10. Sometimes they walk into ambushes, and maybe it's because uh, the generals come in too early and have not been sinasabi ng mga ba hindi pa luto. Everybody needs a certain amount of uh, uh, acclimatation, a certain amount of experience. Uh, there is not. Uh, there should really be no limitation as to age, but really, in the armed forces, there should be a, uh, a lot of uh, uh, support given to people who have uh, experience uh, and uh, who have been around uh, uh, certain situations in our country. Uh, certainly, the AP chief of staff should have should be able to uh, be able to talk to the president on the condition of the military. And if asked, he should be able to advise. He should be knowledgeable about the situation throughout the world and in the region, especially during these times when we are taunted, when we are challenged by all kinds of uh, uh, neighbors and uh, certainly uh, will require, uh, therefore, the kind of leadership that will provide spunk, that will provide the necessary wherewithal, and of course, the necessary integrity uh, that makes people look up to the military uh, as uh, really the bastion of hope and protection in case there's external conflict or internal uh, conflict. And so uh, we thought that we would uh, 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 file this bill. And I, in fact, it's so important to me that I ask, uh, and I thank him, uh, I ask uh, uh, Senator Luxon, who is head of the uh, Secretary of National Defense, uh, 
or rather as chairman of the National Defense Committee, I asked him if I could uh, act uh, as committee. Yes, please go ahead. You have a minute, sir. Please. Uh, please, order. Uh, can, you, can you mute the order. Can you please mute the microphone if you're going to speak? Hello. No, I think it that might be uh, uh, very difficult to balance in fact if you're back. Somebody somebody uh, should be muted. Uh, the government, development and growth, and then at the same time the fight. Yeah, somebody has to mute. Uh, and, uh, it's very difficult, right? Uh, all right, thank you very much. Uh, uh, we are in a very difficult situation because we can't see ourselves virtually. And at times we tend to forget that we have to have control of the microphone. We have to mute or unmute as the case may be. The objective of the bill obviously is to enhance professionalism in the organization by strengthening the merit system and allow the new leadership a longer period to implement reforms and institutionalize good policies that will redound to the improvement of the AP and the nation as a whole. Uh, we have to promote the most qualified officers of general rank, the creme de la creme, so to speak, must be selected. And the president cannot use, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, previous relationships, uh, even if it's important, but the uh, national interest of the country must be done all the time in the, in the appointment of the uh, uh, Again, I recommend you to pay attention. Please, please uh, mute yourself. Thank you. Hello, Jay. Hello. Hello, Jay. Uh, Amy, Amy, can you mute yourself, please, Senator Amy? All right. Finally, uh, we would like to obviate the revolving door ac accommodation promotions. I think. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm I'm being judgmental, but I really believe it's a revolving door uh, accommodation promotions that have been uh, ruling uh, our military, uh, and for so long we've been waiting for the modernization of our armed forces. It could be a very very uh, credible uh, institution, not only within the military, but from other countries uh, whose uh, generals uh, stay longer and are able to uh, uh, acquire the necessary years and experience that uh, we can do. And so we have uh, uh, decided to fix the term for the uh, for the key officers uh, of the armed forces, three years for the <laughs> uh, and the vice chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and of course, the chief of the Philippine Army, Philippine Navy and Air Force, commander of the Joint Forces Command, commander of the Philippine Marine Corps, commandant of the Philippine Marine Corps, Marine Corps I should say, commander of the Special Operations Command and commander of the Cybersecurity Command. And four years for the superintendent of the academy, Mr. President, uh, gentlemen. And of course, you have also adjust, adjusted the age of compulsory retirement for military personnel. I believe uh, most of you have read this, so I would, Stop speaking uh, and uh, allow uh, our resource persons to give their impressions and their comments on the matter, as well as the senators. Uh, uh, the minority board leader, would you like to make a comment preliminarily, or would you like to rather listen to the our guests from the military, both retired and active, and serving in the civilian in uh, the, the current administration? Senator Dillon? Yes. Uh... Uh, Senator Gordon, good morning. Uh, good morning to our uh, uh, Armed Forces of the Philippines. Uh, at the outset, let me congratulate uh, the good Senator, Senator Gordon, for introducing this measure and for the initiative that he has taken to uh, for the Committee on National Defense to give priority to the consideration of this measure. Uh, indeed, uh, Mr. Chairman, this is not the first time that this measure has come up before uh, the Philippine Senate. Uh, sometime uh, during the 15th Congress, a similar law was passed, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, a similar law on, on uh, granting uh, on, on the terms of, of, terms of the uh, of office of the uh, armed chief of staff of the armed forces. A uh, Senate bill uh, to Eight six nine was approved by the Senate, and uh, 
uh, together with House Bill Number Six, it was sent as a uh, approved measure uh, of Congress uh, to the President. However, President Aquino then vetoed the measure, as the records will show. And the veto was principally based on two grounds. Number one, the matter of the constitutionality. Uh, signed, the President citing uh, a Section 12, Paragraph 5, Article 16 of our Constitution, mandating that laws on retirement of military officers shall not allow for an extension of service. And uh, second, a policy issue, uh, uh, because the uh, president, the rightfully as commander-in-chief of the armed forces, must, it is absolutely essential that the chief of staff of the AFP must enjoy the full trust and confidence of the president. So these are the, 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 the two issues that, uh, the two grounds for the uh, veto of uh, Senate Bill uh, 2869 and House Bill number six. Uh, it is uh, hoped that we can uh, take a, a second look, whether we agree with the veto or not. Uh, the fact is it was vetoed on these two grounds and it is best that uh, we, we should address this. In this uh, moreover, <laughs> Uh, Mr. Chairman, and indeed, uh, I agree with you, this is timely and essential. Since 1986, this issue has cropped up regularly. And it has, you know, <laughs> since it was so sensitive, it was so difficult, uh, it was uh, always uh, swept under the rug until uh, the, the 15th Congress. And unfortunately, uh, the... Uh, the uh, bill was vetoed, uh, uh, having been in uh, as executive secretary, uh, I am sure that the president, whoever he or she is, would be relying on the, uh, uh, on the advice of the pertinent government officers, whatever a bill is presented to the president for his or her signature. I will not be surprised. I, know that I do not know it for a fact. But it is reasonable to assume that the armed forces or maybe an officially uh, expressed reservation about, uh, about uh, the passage of uh, about, uh, Senate Bill 2869, uh, which was presented for signature. I am uh, saying that out of speculation, uh, uh, out of my experience, and I am not saying that uh, as a fact, but it is not unusual, and the better part, really, of governance is you consult. And I will not be surprised if President Aquino then consulted and the comment of the armed forces was not favorable. The other aspect of this uh, bill, Mr. President, is at least from my initial reading of the measure, it can help us in our problem of the uh, unfunded retirement liability of the government. And that is what I would like to raise later on, how this would affect the unfunded retirement. Because you and I, Mr. Chairman, fully appreciate that today, the amount of the, the budget and the allocation for the retirement pay of our armed forces is, I think, as big as, if not bigger, than the regular uh, budget for personal services. Uh, that is why the ability of uh, the government to fund the modernization program of the AFP is affected uh, by, by, by this uh, large uh, unfunded retirement liability. But let me emphasize that uh, uh, this is not, uh, that, that, let me emphasize that this affects uh, the uh, uh, ability of the armed forces to modernize itself because uh, of, of, of this uh, huge uh, allocation for retirement. Um, uh, and, uh, although looking at our national budget, uh, this is not a monopoly, this problem is not a monopoly of the armed forces. Today, Mr. Chairman, as you look at our proposed budget for 2021, there is higher budget for PS than for capital outlay. 
And this is the kind of, uh, of, of a uh, allocation which uh, prohibits us from moving forward faster. A, a, you know, you need not be an expert uh, management, uh, you need not be an, um, a management expert uh, to realize that an, an organization uh, which has, uh, uh, which devotes its funds more for PS than for capital outlay cannot move as fast as it should. So it is with these thoughts, Mr. President, that uh, Mr. Chairman, that I once more extend my congratulations to Senator Gordon, the author of this measure, for bringing up this measure again, and to the committee for giving priority in its calendar for the consideration of this uh, bill. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and we look forward to a fruitful discussion with our resource persons. Thank you. Uh, the floor leader. Uh, I, can you hear me? I think, uh, yeah. Okay. Yes, I can. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, for the record, we have Senator De La Rosa, Senator Marcos, Senator uh, uh, Binay, and uh, somebody else arrived. I, th I thought somebody else arrived. But anyway, we also have uh, uh, General Gaudencio Coliado, uh, and certainly uh, uh, Efren Abu, former Chief of Staff, and uh, the Deputy CENTCON Commander, I don't know if I've called him. Uh, can you please identify yourself, sir? Unmute yourself, please. Yes, sir. Uh, Brigadier General uh, Jose Benita, sir. Uh, Deputy CENTCON, sir. Jose Benita, <laughs> thank you, sir. And of course, uh, we have uh, uh, Lieutenant General Jose C. Faustino, Lieutenant General Paredes, uh, uh, and of course, Vice Admiral, well, I've already uh, called him. Uh, so uh, let's, uh, now that we've heard the minority side, uh, with the permission of our, because we have a lot of guests right now, uh, with the permission of my colleagues, uh, I will uh, I will call them to, I will call our guests right away uh, so that uh, uh, I will not tarry a little anymore and uh, proceed to calling the guests and maybe uh, later on, uh, there will be wide latitude for the senators to ask questions. I promise you that. It's a very important measure, and we'd like to hear all the senators uh, make their observations and comments and suggestions. Uh, with the permission of the, of, the, of the body, I'd like to call, first and foremost, uh, the uh, uh, Secretary of National Defense, uh, the Honorable Del Lorenzana, to make his comments on the matter, and then I'll call uh, the others by seniority. I hope then General Adan, can you help me? Text me who is the a senior senior officer uh, that is retired uh, in the in the hall later on. You can just text me. Thank you, Senator uh, Secretary Lorenzana is recognized. Sir, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me, sir? Can you hear me? Yeah. Mr. Chairman, uh, mem and uh, members, other members of the Senate, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Senator Gordon for initiating the draft of this uh, bill. And I would like also to thank him for uh, accommodating some of the uh, proposals that we have uh, submitted to him. And that is now part of the bill. Uh, I'm one of those uh, officers way back in 1987 who was uh, batting for a longer pe period for the chief of staff. But as we focus on the chief of staff, uh, it also, it, it's also true that uh, in the lower ranks up to the uh, brigadier general rank, there is also revolving door of changes of officers. And because of the simple fact that the retirement age is 56, by the time a colonel becomes brigadier general, he's already past 50. I became a brigadier general when I was already uh, uh, 52. 52, so that gives me, and retiring in 50, uh, 56, that gave, that gave me only four years. Not enough to, uh, sabi nga ni Senator Gordon, 
hindi naluto to assume other positions. So, so we see now um, commanders staying in their jobs, brigade commanders for only six months, division commanders for one year. So it is not conducive to um, to good leadership because of the, the constant changing of commanders. At alam naman natin na pagka nagpalit ang commander, magpapalitin ng policy. So, there's no continuity, like uh, Senator Gordon said. So, I look forward. We have here some uh, of our staff, the commanding, commanding generals of the services, retired uh, generals who are uh, very, very anxious also to have this bill pass. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I think the most senior here is uh, General Farolan, if I'm not mistaken. I haven't gotten the list from uh, 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 General Adan. Uh, may I call uh, General Farolan, who's usually very erudite, he's very erudite, uh, our matter executive. General Farolan? Uh, yes. Um, uh, <clears throat> good morning, Senator Gordon and the members of the committee. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Senator Gordon for his uh, <clears throat> initiative in uh, preparing this uh, bill. Uh, I have been particularly uh, advocating for some time now the uh, change in the policy regarding the uh, tour of duty of our senior military leaders. And uh, to tell you, frankly, for a while, I thought nobody was hearing or that nobody cared and that people were just too happy to maintain the status quo. Uh, that, that's been about 20 years, 20 years that we've been having this uh, revolving door. So you can imagine in 20 years, we had about 23 chiefs of staff. And at one point, we had three chiefs of staff being um, uh, sworn into office with the appropriate par parade and review. And uh, it was getting to be a little bit uh, funny to not just us, but even to foreigners who have been invited to Camp Aguinaldo, uh, the first question they ask people is, uh, uh, wh why are we changing our uh, military leader so often, uh, three times in one year? Uh, is there something that we, we, we have to understand? So for the last 20 years, we have been talking about this uh, revolving door. And so I'm so uh, glad that uh, finally we have uh, this uh, bill introduced by Senator Gordon to correct this policy. Now, uh, it is true Senator Drillon mentioned that uh, a similar bill was uh, on the desk of President Aquino during his term, but he vetoed the bill. And I understand that the bill was vetoed for two reasons. First was uh, constitu constitutional limitations, and second was a matter of policy. My question is, if it was um, against the Constitution, why is it that during the term of President Ramos and President Arroyo, we had chiefs of staff who were being extended beyond 56 years old? I, I give the example of uh, General Arturo Enrile, who was extended by President Ramos um, beyond age 56. The other example I can think of is during the time of President Arroyo, General Hermogenes Esperon was extended beyond age 56. 
And yet, nobody apparently was complaining. Nobody raised the issue of uh, a uh, violation of the Constitution. But uh, this um, uh, veto by President Aquino cites this as one of the reasons why he opposed the, uh, the bill. On the second point, uh, which is uh, concerning uh, policy by the Commander-in-Chief, there is no question that our Commander-in-Chief uh, has the right to choose his Chief of Staff. And for him, it is indeed very important that he must have full confidence and trust in the chief of staff that he appoints. But certainly, a fixed term of office for the chief of staff does not mean that the president cannot remove him at any time that he feels uh, he has lost confidence in the man. And so I, I would think that this should not be a valid uh, issue against having a fixed term of office. The president can remove or change his chief of staff a day, one day after he appoints him, if he feels that he has lost confidence in, in the chief of staff. And uh, so um, I, I um, hope that um, with this uh, bill that has been proposed, we will be able to uh, move forward and uh, provide a um, better environment for the leadership of the armed forces to uh, participate in. I, I just uh, would like to point out also that isn't it coincidence that the Holo bombing takes place just when we have a new West Mincom chief? Uh, uh, it seems the enemy knows precisely when to, when to attack. Uh, they know that uh, the new guy is just feeling his way through. And um, he, uh, th this is his time really to, to, uh, to, to do a monkey business. If you review, that is the same with the Marawi incident. I think um, when a new Westmincom chief was uh, placed there, the uh, rebels in Marawi had already prepared their positions, but they waited until a little bit more time when there was a change of uh, command in the area before they struck. And besides, the chief of staff was also out of the country at that time. But I, I, I just mentioned these uh, incidents to point out that we are not the only ones who are concerned about the frequent change of command of our um, units. The other side is also wait, watching closely. And I, I believe that uh, they do their actions on the basis of some of these changes. Not always, but I am certain that it enters into their uh, uh, thinking when they plan their actions. Now, uh, I, I know I've taken up much of your time, but I, I just wanted to mention that um, I'm very happy about the four years that is proposed for the superintendent of the PMA, the Military Academy. Uh, the military academy is the primary source of our regular officers. Not the, major not the majority, but most of the top leaders come from the school. In fact, I, I might mention that of the 
20 plus chiefs of staff in the last 20 years all have come from the Philippine Military Academy. So you can see how important it is that we have an academy that is also well run. And uh, when I say well run, of course, I, uh, I would like to say that uh, we have a man who is not going to be changed after six months or one year, but he is going to be there to see to it that the cadets are properly trained and prepared for the military career. Now that I mentioned the PMA, I also uh, would like to, to mention that we need officers from other sources. We cannot be relying too much always on the PMA. Uh, it is not good for the service. In business, monopoly is not good. In the armed forces, monopoly of the leadership is also not good. Before we had officers coming in through the ROTC program and they became officers and became um, chiefs of staff, service uh, commanders, there was competition. But now there is no competition. There is a monopoly. And so I am, I was also glad to hear that Senator Gordon was uh, planning to revive the ROTC program. I think this would be uh, complementary to all the moves that are going to be taken because they will, they, they will favor the armed forces. We cannot have everybody thinking the same way. We must have people who also think uh, differently. That, that is the way we can we move forward. Uh, I, I know this is really not part of the discussion this morning, but I just wanted to, to, to mention it. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Your, your words are golden. Golden. Uh, I will now call on General De Villa. Uh, I think he's the next senior uh, general in rank here, retired. He doesn't look like he's retired. He just looks like he just woke up this morning very early. General De Villa? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, Senator Gordon. I, I am here to, uh, first of all, thank you for taking the initiative to correct the revolving door policy in so far as the chief of staff of the armed forces is concerned by way of a presidential choice. Uh, secondly, I would like to uh, also express that this is a much needed change this is a very much needed reform in the armed forces because the behavior of the armed forces as a whole basically depends on, <clears throat> on the behavior of the chief of staff of the armed forces, who is the overall leader of the uniformed services of our country so far as the armed forces is concerned. Mr. Chairman, uh, I also noted that uh, this is the second time that uh, an attempt is being made to correct uh, the problem of uh, the tenure of the chief of staff of the armed forces in the Philippines. And I would like also to express, uh, just like uh, General Farola, my gratitude to you for taking this initiative. Uh, we have been waiting for this for a long time. Uh, Next item, uh, Mr. Chairman, is that uh, I have noted in the draft uh, bill that we are in effect, or rather the bill is rather in effect of uh, legislating certain positions in the armed forces of the Philippines, uh, such as that mentioned as the Joint Chief of Staff, uh, the Chairman, and then the commanders of the services, and so forth and so on. 
My view, Mr. Chairman, is that this is in effect uh, legislating already uh, what is now, I believe, carried in a department order of uh, the Department of National Defense issued by uh, Secretary Lorenzana to reorganize at least the titles of the senior officers of the armed forces. Now, Mr. Chairman, I think this is the first time that uh, positions in the armed forces, uh, other than the chief of staff and major service commanders, are becoming or be are being legislated. Uh, I, I, I would recommend uh, that uh, uh, we stick to the old, or the, the bill should stick to the old titles or uh, designations of, this, of the uh, uh, senior officers concerned uh, and leave it to the uh, uh, Secretary of National Defense to, to designate or, uh, or uh, I would say, uh, rename the different positions in the armed forces of the Philippines in order that uh, we can preserve the flexibility in the organization of the armed forces of the Philippines because the armed forces of the Philippines has to respond and react to certain international national and international security conditions and if we fix the the organization of the armed forces of the philippines by way of these titles uh via legislation it will take another legislation to reorganize or uh, change the designations all over again uh, it used to be, if I, if I remember correctly, it used to be only uh, by way of uh, a defense uh, issuance, if not an executive order. I'm not very sure about it anymore. But my point is that we are up, uh, the, the bill is actually legislating already the positions that are uh, to be identified in the armed forces of the Philippines, where uh, a term of service is. Uh, is mandated, like, uh, like for instance, uh, the, the Special Operations Command. Uh, later on, it may no longer be called a Special Operations Command, and so forth and so on. Uh, the third point, uh, Mr. Chairman, is that uh, in the old system, it used to be that uh, the number of general officers or flag officers, as we call them, is uh, based on the number of active officers on duty and not in, the, in terms of the total number of the armed forces personnel as uh, proposed in this legislation. Uh, I, I, if I recall it correctly, the number of general or flag officers uh, used to be only 0.75% of all uh active officers in the armed forces then later on it became one percent now i think there are too many of them it's more than one percent already so my my recommendation mr chairman is instead of basing the number of general and flag officers on the total strength of the armed forces we base it only on the number of active officers in the armed forces of the philippines so that uh, uh, we can expand uh, the strength of the armed forces without necessarily expanding the number of general officers, because I think there are too many now. And then lastly, uh, Mr. Chairman, I am happy that you have taken note of the provision of uh, no appointment of Secretary of National Defense until after uh, three years of retired service. Uh, so that's all that I have in mind, uh, Mr. Chairman. Lastly, I want to thank you again for taking this initiative, which you have been taking, which you have been waiting for for a long, long time since President Pinoy vetoed the old bill that both houses of Congress passed. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, can I request our resource persons 
to address the issue of constitutionality, which was uh, ground for the veto. Whoever is qualified, whoever can talk about that. Uh, I'm interested in, I'm, I'm supporting this bill, but I'm interested in how we handle that uh, objection on constitutionality, uh, which, uh, which basically says that uh, there should be no extension uh, of uh, term of the of the officers, I have no problem with uh, the uh, three year term that's provided in the constitution. But the uh, prohibition against uh, extension um, found in the constitution, we all know what is the reason for this, and uh, this is because of the problem that arose uh, during the martial law years when a lot of officers uh, stayed for a lifetime, if I may exaggerate, uh, which uh, resulted in the demoralization of the, uh, of, 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 of the other officers. So this, was, this is why this provision was inserted. So in the course of your uh, presentation, may I personally request, uh, Mr. Chairman, the resource persons to address this particular issue. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Senator Dillon. As usual, uh, that's a very, very good question. And I'd like to commend uh, General De Villa for his uh, sparkling comments. I, th I think they were very, very useful. Uh, I just want to make some corrections here before we continue and uh, ask the uh, resource persons if they have any comments on the constitutionality of the me uh, measure and, of course, other, other measures in the uh, proposed legislation. I just want to correct myself here. It's a mistake on my part. I overlook it. In the terms of office under Section 2, uh, subsection B, uh, there's a term, uh, Chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff. Actually, that should have read Chief of Staff and uh, uh, who shall also be Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. There is no extra position that is being uh, added, Mr. President. Automatically, the Chief of Staff of the Armed Forces shall be the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Uh, in the meantime, also, uh, I thank uh, Secretary De Villa. Uh, yes, uh, upon the advice of uh, current doctrine by the Secretary of National Defense, is creating a joint chief of staff. I also look at the uh, pattern uh, in the American Armed Forces, uh, for which largely we have patterned ourselves. Uh, uh, in the matter of U 10 U.S. Code uh, 152, uh, joint chiefs of staff is mentioned there, and. Uh, uh, I, I, I adhere to your comments about the uh, uh, possibility that in the future you may not make operations command. The source of the uh, uh, proposal, and these are not cast in stone as yet, and that's why we all have you here. Can anybody please uh, uh, comment on the? Uh, on the constitutionality, if any, uh, on the matter of the constitutionality of this uh, the extension. Uh, because my position is, uh, I believe that uh, uh, only the chief of staff can be extended and only during times of, uh, uh, and all the other exception is in, huh? all there. Uh, but uh, for the rest of the general officers, we have a three year term. And the very fact that you're extending the retirement age to 65, obvious the fact that we have uh, what you call uh, a revolving door. Uh, anyway, uh, can we call uh, other folks? If nobody's going to answer the observations, we can go ahead and discuss it. Uh, I would, uh, can I ask uh, the gentlemen and our guests to raise their hands so that uh, we can call them? General Adan, I know that you have a lot of uh, thinking uh, done here. But before you do that, I'd like to call the General of the Philippine uh, Military Academy to uh, make his uh, uh, observations with the permission of General Adan. I'll call uh, the General of the Philippine Military Academy, uh, whom we have invited all the way uh, from Baguio, although he's in Baguio. Uh, uh, sir, uh, would you please uh, take, the, uh, take the podium? Uh, General Kusi? Yes, sir. Uh, to the Honorable uh... Chairman uh, Senator Gordon, uh, the Honorable uh, Secretary of National Defense, Secretary Lorenzana, uh, the uh, other honorable members of the Senate, my fellow workers in government. Uh, good morning. Thank you, sir, for inviting me. 
and for giving uh, education and training of our future officers uh, importance in uh, crafting this uh, uh, Senate bill. Uh, the only comment that I can give is regard to the uh, tenure of the uh, superintendent of PNA, uh, which was highlighted as four years separate from the chief of staff and the other uh, major services. Uh, just to give the uh, members an idea uh, for why, why, why the uh, four years? First, uh, let me highlight that the superintendent conveys the vision and strategic direction of the academy and ensures alignment with that of the different major services. Second, the superintendent establishes the environment, sets the tone, and crafts the priorities of his or her subordinates. These tasks include being a role model and embodying the services values. Third, the superintendent build teams and shape their organizational environments. Fourth, superintendents build and nurture many external relationships. Fifth, they act in multiple ceremonial roles, internally and externally. And finally, superintendents must lead in crisis, often in the midst of national level attention. A superintendent's role can be, can be described in light of the Academy's mission statement. In developing uh, leaders of character to serve the nation, the superintendent relies on three key subordinates who are each directly responsible for a specific mission element. The commandant of cadets who is charged with leader development, the dean or professors who is charged with intellectual development, and the director of this sports uh, development, physical education, who is charged with physical development. For a superintendent to successfully accomplish the academy mission requires him or her to synergize the efforts of those three mission elements so as to achieve the greatest possible moral, mental, and physical development. The unique academy environment requires the superintendent to rely on team building, empathy, persuasion, and authority of command to obtain a commitment to shared leadership across the three mission elements. In particular, to implement significant change, the superintendent must employ these leadership attributes to ensure all stakeholders are invested in his or her initiatives and the academy's strategic goals. In this regard, the long-term faculty is an especially challenging constituency. So it's, it's very important. Character development is a particularly important task for uh, the superintendent's role. It illustrates the superintendent's synchronizing role as efforts to develop the cadets, the midshipmen, the airmen uh, character. It cuts across all three mission elements. The three elements must be mutually supporting the commandant of cadets, the dean of the academic, the physical uh, education of our cadets to achieve character development and every leader, faculty member, and coach has a role in this 24-hour day of mission. So I, highlight, I highlighted the role of the superintendent to inform uh, the members of the Senate and uh, my fellow workers of government uh, the reason why uh, it's four years. It's, it's really uh, uh, a challenge to do all, all of these things uh, in, in one year's time. Uh, right now, uh, one of my roles, because I will be retiring in November 17 of this year, is to ensure that my successor, it will either come from, uh, from, from the Commandant of Cadet or the Assistant Superintendent of PMA, so that all, all, the, all the initiatives, all the reforms, all the interventions that uh, we made since I assumed office Will be will be continued with the passage of this bill. Uh, my my successor uh, will will be given enough time to institute these needed changes, and uh, 
he will also be given time to correct if there are any uh, problems uh, along the way. That is all. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, sir. Uh, yes, uh, Senator Dillon. Oh, sorry. Specifically, Mr. Chairman, I would reiterate my request. Uh, would setting a retirement age violate the Constitution? My view is that it will not. And is this the solution in order to go around, uh, in order to uh, prevent um, a, a, a violation of the Constitution? My view, Mr. Chairman, is that what is prohibited is when you extend the retirement of an officer. But when you, when you pass a law setting the age of retirement, I don't think that's covered by the constitutional prohibition. But I would like to seek the views of our resource persons on that point. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The point is well taken. Uh, again, uh, it's reiterated. Uh, perhaps, uh, General Adan, uh, did you have anybody uh, in mind here who can answer the questions of Senator Dillon? On the military? Uh -huh. Senator Gordon, can I say something? Sorry? This, uh, sure this, is General, this, is, this is General Abu. Can I say something? Uh, yes, General Abu, go ahead. Yes, uh, I, I agree with uh, Senator Drillon because our Constitution does not say that uh, you retire at age 56. The solution is really to have a new retirement law. So that, you know, you don't have to extend the rank of the officers. Probably we have to be promotion in rank or retirement in rank. Oh, well, our process can study several ways how to go about it. That's my point of view, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, General Abu. But actually, uh, if, if, if the law, the, the proposed law says all generals can retire at 65. Only the chief of staff can be extended, Mr. President, by three years, uh, uh, for three years, uh, or in times of war. Uh, so, uh, with the permission of the body, I'd like to call uh, General Adan. Go ahead, go ahead, uh, General Adan. Uh, um, uh, for the armed forces. Now, um, I, I'd like to start first because Admiral Kusi mentioned uh, his stint as superintendent. I was superintendent of PMA uh, in 2002, and before me, five superintendents served less than one year. Whoa. Some served three months, <laughs> one served six months. So I was selected because I can stay longer. So I served for 27 months. Now, <laughs> In the U.S. Military Academy, uh, Mr. Chair, the West Point superintendent serves four years. The major service commanders, chief of army, chief of navy, have, has only a term of three years. So uh, you can see the importance of uh, the position of the Military Academy superintendent. And this goes through for Air Force Academy, Naval Academy. Anyway, um, in, in our armed forces now, Mr. Chair, we have we have uh, various kinds of type units. Now, the major services are sports providers, okay? And then we have the unified or combatant commanders like uh, West Mincom, CENCOM. They're the force deployers. Now, each one of these requires, uh, each position requires not only skills, uh, expertise, education, but knowledge of uh, the geography, the people there. He has to deal with the uh, various leaders, in the, and that takes time. So that uh, this law that um, provides fixed tenures for the various general ranks is really uh, very positive in uh, addressing the, the challenges meeting the armed forces. For example, the Joint Chiefs, uh, I mean, the Chief of Staff and the Major Services Commanders, at that level, which is already strategic, they have, they have uh, to be concerned not only with operational matters, 
they have to deal with national, the national leadership. They have to deal with the Senate, Congress, and their advisors to our national leaders. So we believe that um, retiring them really at age 56 and giving them only short terms, parang ang nangyari sir ngayon, eh, escalator, ano, lahat nagmamadali para makaabot sa, uh, you know, the higher ranks. And that is what happens. And we can see the uh, very negative effects. A, a general involved, for example, in the unified commands, I, I was South Com chief when I retired, uh, has to plan for a campaign. It's called campaign planning, not just operations. Campaign planning is a series of operations. But then uh, because of the short term uh, that we uh, provide our unified commanders, less than a year normally before he gets retired or, he, or promoted up, uh, he, he is not able to do that. And same with the chief of staff. So um, we're happy about this. And uh, may, I, may I cite uh, uh, Senator Dillon's concern on the retirement uh, budget. I'd like I'd like to give um, uh, 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 to to uh, cite a practice of other nations. Uh, China, for example, China has no rank of brigadier general. They call it senior colonel. Thailand has no brigadier general. They call it special colonel. So from colonel, the next rank is major general. The reason when I asked a Chinese senior colonel who was commanding a division of 10,000 men, ang sagot ng in-check na general sa akin, sir, generals are expensive. You have to give them an aid, you have to give them a staff car, but in the Chinese army, senior colonels command a 10,000 man division. So major generals command higher uh, position. So, I mean, these are just the practices. Uh, we, we, our, our armed forces is patterned after the Americans with the rank of Brigadier General. But then, uh, to, I just cited that, that uh, example uh, as a possible configuration that uh, we can adapt. Uh, I, I'm sure not too many people will be happy if we reduce the ranks, but it's how other uh, countries uh, address that uh, problem. Uh, also, we have to, of course, recognize the fact that our defense budget uh, is really below what the ideal budget called for in the national security strategy, which is 2% of our GDP. Uh, uh, the 1% the of GDP now is really very low, and everyone knows that 80% of the budget the AUP goes to salaries, including those for the pensioners like me and uh, our group. So uh, that's another issue, Mr. Chair, uh, not covered in this uh, hearing. But uh, uh, the, the law also provides for um, various, uh, not just the fixed terms, but also the tenure in grade of certain officers. And I, I think that is very good. Uh, in, in the US military, normally an officer retires at the rank of colonel or 30 years in the service. And that's averaging about age 55. But when they get promoted to general, that's when a fixed term is provided. A, a, a one star could get, could get a two, two year uh, term for his position. And if he is promoted, the next rank, a major general, he gets three years. The, the, the term is fixed on the position, what it calls for. So the chiefs of army, chief of navy, uh, or the chief of uh, naval operations has three years. But the chairman, joint chiefs of staff, is only two years. Four star, chairman, joint chief staff, US is two years with an extension or possible extension of another two years. So uh, uh, that, that's the way they uh, configure it. Generally, officers run, uh, retire at colonel. Only generals go higher. 
So you have ranks, a four-star general of a U.S. chairman, maybe 62 years old, 63 years old, but it is fixed on the position, uh, not, not the age. Uh, these are, and, and Japan also practices the same thing. And uh, China now, uh, which has also adopted the Western type uh, uh, ranks. So uh, uh, that is all for now, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you again uh, in behalf of our group uh, or, or on behalf of our group for inviting us. Thank you. I'm sorry. At this point, I'd like to ask uh, 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 the uh, resource persons to raise their hands if they're going to speak. But in the meantime, I will call on the other senators to ask questions at this point in time. Uh, you know, with your permission, uh, uh, unless uh, another general would like to comment on the discussion, I would most well, uh, I, they, they would be most welcome. Are there any senators ready to uh, ask a question right now? Uh, Senator Dillon? The absence of any colleague who would want to raise a question, I'd just like to ask one crucial question. What does our resource persons think of uh, uh, compulsory age of 65 for an officer? Uh, I would like to get their views because right now it's 56, if I recall correctly, or uh, 30 years of service, whichever comes first. So 65 is a radical departure from the system today. To me, this is very crucial, and I would like to get the views of our resource persons on this particular uh, issue, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Yes, yes. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, in answer to uh, Senator Delon's query, the uh, age 65 is uh, actually for the chief of staff. I'm sure that no nobody uh, um, uh, below the chief of staff will retire at 65, because if we have uh, made a computation that um, when an officer, when a, when a colonel gets promoted to uh, to uh, brigadier general, maybe at age 50, if he goes up, then he he may become the chief of staff, the chief of staff, but. We, we we only have uh, limited positions in the three three star position, two star position. We have a lot in the uh, one star position, and the law says that if you are not promoted to the next higher rank, you retire. So along the way, retire na po ng retire yan. So yung lang isa ang tumutuloy. And in fact, uh, according to my to some of our competition here in um, DND, baka nga hindi makarating ng 65 yan, eh, mag-retire na. Si Carlos has already served three years of his uh, tenure. And then the other ranks naman, yung mga colonel, they retire at a certain age or after uh, serving their tenure in grade in this rank. Like for instance, uh, colonel, after he has been a colonel for uh, nine years, at hindi siya nakpromote ng uh, Brigadier General, he, he's out. He retires from the service. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mm. Sorry. Um, uh, Secretary Lorenzano, from your standpoint, uh, really the 65 years old is for the uh, Chief of Staff. Is that correct, sir? Yes, sir. So that uh, we can give, we, we we can give the uh, uh, ship up leeway to a uh, service uh, service of three years. Kung abutan siya ng 65 while in position na wala pa three years. Hmm. Uh, yeah. In other words, uh, Mr. Chairman, the 60 because of the attrition rule found in the bill, uh, only the chief of staff will in fact be retiring at 65. The others uh, will be retiring earlier because of the rule on attrition. That's how I gather it from Secretary Lorenzana, if he can confirm it. Is that correct, sir? That's, that is correct, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Are there other questions uh, from the senators? If there are no questions, I'd like to ask uh, our uh, resource persons to make comments. Uh, uh, on the bill, 
Mr. Chairman? Secretary yeah. Lawrence Hanapo. Yeah. 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 Uh, what does uh, the others think of the uh, provision that I inserted there? That uh, general officer, because we are giving them, all general officers have three years in a certain rank, that they should serve two years in that rank. And when they after serving two years, and when they retire, they may retain, they, they can retire on that rank. But if not, if they serve less than two years, then they will retire on their pre, in their uh, per, uh, previous permanent rank. Now, my uh, I put this uh, provision uh, pr proposal, Mr. President, so that uh, we, we, it, we prevent people from gaming the system. Maka mayroon dyan magpapapromote lang. Tapos ang pinapromote na, mag-retire na kasi nakuha niyo na yung rank ko. Now, uh, he has to serve he has to serve a certain amount of time that rank to deserve to retire in that rank. And I think if the, if the uh, tenure is uh, three years, at least two-thirds is he served niya so that he is entitled to uh, retire in that rank. Thank you, sir. Yes, uh, so he has to stay for three years in that rank. So they doesn't take advantage uh, or papa promote lang our system. Ibigay nyo na muna sa akin na para makuha ko yung retirement. Ito yung pinag-iba ng Supreme Court. Hindi lang sa inyo. Anyway, uh, are there comments? I just saw, uh, yes. Forgive me, Senator Dillon. I just call uh, General Dan. Go ahead, yes. General Dan. Simple, Mr. Chair, is up or out. You're, you, you either go up or, or you're out. If you yes. don't get promoted, you're out. Position, yeah. You get another two or three years, depending on the rank uh, requirements and the position. If you don't get promoted to Major General, you're out. If you don't get promoted to Lieutenant General, as a Major General, you're out. Up or out. Thank you. Yes, yes. go ahead. Yes. Uh, well, uh, General Adan, that's not unusual. We have adopted a similar system in the Bureau of Customs. There is that rule on attrition. If you uh, do not get promoted after a certain number of years, you're out. Anyway, the, my question is, um, there is a proposal from Secretary de Villa that the number of flag officers should be based as a proportion to the number of uh, officers in the active service, rather than what is proposed in the law now, that uh, the uh, number of flag officers is based on the total strength of the AFP. Uh, first, what is the num what is the proportion now? How many? What's is there a uh, what is the basis? Right? What is the law right now? And what is the view of our resource persons on uh, the, the proposal of Senator De Villa to uh, maintain the number of flag officers based on the number of officers in the active service? May we have? May we hear our? Reaction, Mr. Chair. Secretary De Villa, please. Uh, you were suggesting that. Uh, I think it was addressed to you. Go ahead, sir. Secretary sure. De Villa, Senator De Villa. It was uh, Secretary De Villa, Senator Gordon, who made that proposal yes. that it should be based not on the total strength of the AFP as what is provided in the bill, but on the uh, not based on a percentage of those in the active service that's what i would like to get uh, comments from our other resource persons yes uh yes uh general dan uh, that formula i believe was uh set decades ago and of course there were certain adjustments over the years but uh Modern armed forces now do not have, uh, I would say, standard standardized number of men because there are specialized units. You have, for example, cyber command. Uh, you have uh, special forces uh, and other things. Now, it doesn't depend on the number of men. Uh, the rank of the commander doesn't depend on the number of men that he has. But the resources he commands, the power of his unit, 
it could be a missile battery, it could be a air defense battalion or a regiment with enough uh, uh, resources to do its mission. But I, I'm, I'm just saying, for example, a cyber command in the United States would be what, a few thousand, maybe two, three thousand, but it's led by a three star or a four star general. Whereas a, a, a three star uh, or a two star division commander would have 12,000 men. So what, what I'm pointing at is the best, uh, I think, standard would be having a table of organization. Uh, and that table of organization, which is approved by Congress, uh, reviewed every year during the budget hearing, establishes how many divisions, how many uh, special units, the type of, uh, of squadrons or, or uh, naval forces, and the rank attached to the commander. So when the table of organization is passed, the rank is already there. The rank is already there. It's not a question of uh, mathematics that, okay, we still have this percentage allowance, let's fill it up. So let's create more units because meron po tayong kulang na, na number of generals because the law allows us to have this ceiling. Uh, rather than going to that, why not fix it to the table of organization, how many brigades, how many divisions? And that is the one approved by Congress because there, are some, there is a budget uh, attached to it. So the rank goes with it. Once that table is, or, is approved, the rank is already approved and whoever sits there gets the rank. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> It really depends on the position, right? Uh, is that correct? Uh, Secretary Dorisana, go ahead. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. I think I support the proposal of uh, Secretary de Villa. Uh, if we follow uh, what Jiradan said, that uh, numbers of brigade, nowadays we have brigades with a very, uh, very few people, not, not even uh, 1,000. Uh, the brigade, brigade, and, and uh, there are so many uh, staffs at uh, general headquarters, uh, deputies, and even the, uh, as you mentioned when we were talking, kahit yung uh, camp commander, a brigadier general na, and uh, you, were, you were even uh, comparing it to the camp commander of uh, Clark, which was only a major or lieutenant colonel. So I, I, I think that uh, we should we should uh, limit the we should peg peg the number of uh, general officers from the number of uh, active officers or uh, num total number of men, whichever is uh, is a better, and then we we tailor our organizations in accordance with those uh, uh, generals. Thank you. Sorry, what uh, can Secretary Lorenzana repeat that? Uh, the uh, proposal of Secretary Julia is that the number of flag officers should be based on the number of team officers. Yeah, active officers, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as uh, I am repeating what uh, Secretary de Villa said, that uh, the general officers should uh, be a percentage of uh, total active commission officers. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Mm. Well, this is not on the total strength of the armed forces. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. Mm. Okay, thank you very much, sir. So do I take it, it really depends on the necessary billets that are available. Would that be correct, sir? Mr. Chairman, yes. Mm. How's that? How's that? That's what I'm trying to figure out. Is there uh, is it uh, is there an exception or uh, it, it is based on the number of active officers? Although you can base it on the on the total strength, which is which, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just want to be clarified. I have no position either way. It would appear that uh, we let's just have one rule. Uh, what is it based on? Is it based on the number of active officers, percentage of the number of active officers, or a percentage of the 
total strength of the armed forces. I think there's a wide difference between the two. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and let, uh, and let uh, General Dan answer. Go ahead, please. Mute. Mute. Naka mute kayo. You're on mute. Yeah. I'm on mute. No. Hello, Mr. Chair. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Okay. Yeah. Uh, the rank structure, I believe, I should do? depend on the type of unit. For example, um, a, uh, a naval uh, ship captain, uh, he is a full colonel, but he only commands maybe 250, 300 men. But he could be a, a lieutenant colonel or commander in the Navy or even a captain, a full colonel. But his unit, his number of men is only a, a few hundreds. And same with the Air Force, okay. because the different oh, of unit, uh, a squadron might have what, 1622 fighter aircraft commanded by a, a Brigadier General, but the number of men he has is just a few hundred. Compared with the Army, where in a brigade is supposed to have three battalions, at least 1,500 men, uh, and also commanded by Colonel. So it depends on the type of unit. That's why. I mentioned the word uh, in the AFP, we call it table of organization and equipment. And that is what is approved. Once the table of organization is approved, the rank is already attached to it, regardless of number of men. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair. Except, uh, Mr. Chairman, that we're crafting a law, and we do not want to get involved in the nitty gritty of uh, fixing the X number of men in a unit. Uh, that's why just looking looking at the total, the present the present law is a certain percentage of the uh, of, of those in active officers as against the proposal of basing it on the total force of the AFP. Uh, we would like to know as uh, policymakers what is best for the organization because uh, you, you you know it's easy to say if you have only a a, a small unit, uh, it should be headed by a, only by a uh, light colonel or a colonel, whatsoever. Except that, sir, our culture, Secretary Adan, is that pakiusapan eh. Pwede mo bang bigyan kami ng, ng, uh, ng WhatsApp general or whatever. That's the reality that we have to face. That is why this is a, 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 a limitation imposed on, uh, on the organization so that we will, we will, we will uh, hopefully it will result in a rational structure rather than a structure based on the healing tayo sa makiusap eh. Sasaba ang loob kung hindi mo magagawin yan. So that is why the, the, I am attracted to the proposition that it should be based on active, on the percentage of active officers as a, a self-imposed limitation on the AFP command insofar as uh, as as uh, as ranks are concerned, and also uh, on the on on the uh, uh, with the attrition, etc. So this should give everybody a chance. And uh, and uh, uh, if you basically agree that it should be based on uh, the number of active officers, uh, then we would report that out if that is the consensus, rather than uh, have two standards. Mr. General Dan? Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Senator. Uh, I, I would leave that to the AFP to uh, determine the number of uh, generals they would need, depending on the type units uh, I, I mentioned. <clears throat> because as the Secretary of Defense uh, mentioned, uh, some of our units are practically half the it strength of what should be. No? And yet we put a general there. Yes, yes. You see, you 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 put a general bucket. <laughs> we know our culture, na? Now the other problem, as uh, General Dan, is the budgetary implication, and that is why there is a proposed limit to this. But to me, the more important issue is the discipline in the organization. And hindi naman a dime dasen yung general natin, hindi po ba? So. We, to me, we, uh, I am in, I am in favor uh, on, on, on the initial examination 
on a proportion on the, on the number of active service, as proposed by Secretary de Vivian. I, I tend to agree with that, uh, Senator Dillon, because I think that uh, we don't want it to be a moving target. Uh, and at the same time, uh, Congress might be blindsided sometimes, you know, by lobbying. And, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, although I think that uh, uh, I would leave some space to the Congress if there is a strong lobby from, uh, uh, you know, a long saying, uh, more, a more collected uh, chief of staff or joint chiefs of staff who can now really think about it and make proposals to the Congress. That means that we have the flexibility to be able to do that. If one day, for example, I mean, I, I you know, you, you can you can take it at the absurdum. You know, a commander of a, a boomer, an SSBN in America is only commanded by sometimes by a commander or lieutenant commander uh, in the Navy, which is the equivalent rank of a lieutenant colonel or a major. Uh, uh, so it really depends. It really depends on the on the situation. So I, I tend to agree uh, again with Senator De Villa, Senator Dillon, Senator Lorenzana that we should base it on the number of officers. Uh, and uh, if there is a, a point at some uh, time in the future that they feel that they need more generals, they have to really explain it in Congress. And I think it should be stated so in the law so that the, the legislature will know uh, what the original policy is based on and what uh, the lobbying is all about so that uh, we don't have to have too many officers at any one time. Is that amenable to everybody? Uh, are you okay with that? Uh, yes, uh, uh, there's a comment here from the Secretary of the Armed Forces. Admiral, Retired Admiral Marayan, sir. Actually, sir, we have three laws that defines the percentages of officers in the Armed Forces. The first was issued in 1948, Republic Act 291, which sets the number of generals to 5.5% of the strength of the officers, the armed forces. And then it was amended by a, an executive order by during martial law, with it at 0.75%. And then there was another law, RA 8186, which carried over forward that the same percentage of general officers in relation to the officer corps. However, RA 8186 went on further allocating the percentages of four stars, three stars, two stars, and one star. And the latest law that is in effect, and I hope this is being followed, is RA 9188 came out in 2002 which increased the percentage of officers, of general officers from 0.75 to 1.125% of the officer corps. So we have actually laws existing to regulate the number of generals and even the allocation of one star, two stars, and four stars. From the retage, I believe 65 would be too old. In the uh, Southeast Asian nations, the retired their generals maximum age of 60. In the U.S., it's 62 years old. So adjusting probably to a little lower than 65 would really uh, be more productive. Now, there should be, sir, in the, uh, in the proposal, a simulation study of how many generals will be affected, and of course, to prevent demoralization in the senior ranks. Because if the general, some occupy the position for three years, then many will, what time will it really start is also a challenge. Now, sir, on the relief of general officers and have no position to handle, <laughs> probably the there should be a period before the officer course, and there should be an investigation first. You cannot uh, remove any uh, investigation result by retiring the officer. The officer should face the consequences of his misdemeanor or offense before he gets retired. In the first place, the requirement to get your pension is to have the clean agencies concerned from human rights to ombudsman 
and other uh, government agencies. So, so I believe, sir, that uh, again, 28 at the general headquarters notice, can we increase the retirement age from 30 years to 56 years? And 30 years, that means if you come to the uh, service at age 17, including your academy years, you will retire at age 47. When we move the retirement age to 56, we notice an increase of uh, officers and enlisted men contracting several diseases. And one of them is, of course, the arthritis. So I think we should try to look also there at the the medicine of our officers and of our officers and men. Uh, sure that they are physically fit to serve, not just because of the age, but more importantly, they will be under. That's all reactions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Uh, you mind uh, uh, not leaning on the table because I think when the table shakes, the uh, uh, the microphone is affected and your communication is really stunted. So, could you repeat that, please, very quickly without shaking the table? <laughs> I know you tried to shake the world, but uh, yes, sir. I agree with you. Thank you. I'm sorry. I apologize if I have inconvenienced you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, first, sir, on the uh, I was I was discussing, sir, the percentage of officers to general officers. We have three laws. I mentioned there are three laws started in 1948 with RA-291, yes. where the percentage of general officers is, was pegged at 0.5%. And then it was followed by an executive order issued by uh, President Marcos. I think that's EO-360 which raised the percentage of officers from 0.5% to 0.75% of the number of officers. And then in the 1980s, or early 90s, RA 8186 again maintained that percentage. <laughs> 0. 0.75, but went further of first differential of generals. And then the latest studies are A9188, which increased further the percentage of general of number of current active serving officers. This, the reason for this was actually pointed out by uh, We've lost you, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, Senator Drillon. Try not to be on the table. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I would just suggest. Uh, yes, sir. Oh, okay, then. Just submit a maybe a short position paper because we find difficulty understanding you. I think your internet connection is uh, a little, your signal is a little weak, so we could not read it. I suggest, Mr. Chairman, that Mr. Badaya be uh, requested to file a position paper in order that we will fully appreciate his position. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Thank you. The chair would like to uh, suggest that uh, the uh, General Mariah, or Admiral Mariah, is it? Uh, please submit a position paper, a short position paper on the matter. Uh, so that uh, I was particularly concerned about your suggestion. And I'd like to hear the others about there could be rack demoralization if you implement. Uh, yes, yeah. uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to react to what uh, Admiral Marayag said. Uh, despite the three laws that uh, he mentioned, kaya nga tayo nandito ngayon because we would like to craft a law that would uh, serve us in these uh, current times. Um, if you remember in the 19... Um, 
70s when we when I was a young lieutenant there were only four area commands in this uh, entire Philippines Tuma, first ma, Tuma, Trima, and uh, they covered the whole of Visayas, covered up the whole Mindanao with only about three battalions. And now that our communication is better, communica uh, transportation is better, we should be able to cover more uh, vast areas uh, with, with uh, less people. Pangalawa, uh, yung tinasabi niya na uh, the age... Uh, People will become uh, old and very weak that they cannot serve. Meron po tayong uh, standard of physical fitness. Eh. And every year we uh, we let we conduct uh, physical fitness for these people, medical and physical fitness, to find out who is still fit to serve. So hindi hindi naman siguro tama yung patatanda na lahat yung uh, ano na yun, eh. Plus we have this as I said a while ago. There is a tenure in grade. Timing grade, tenure in grade, that if you are not promoted to the next higher rank, abai retired ka na, retired ka na. No, ba, uh, no, no bats of a soldier will retire at the same time at uh, age 65 or 56. Some of them will fall uh, behind along, along the way, and only the best will reach uh, the, uh, the higher uh, enlisted rank. Um, so... I think that's that's all for now, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, by the way, the tenure in grade means that you have to not only be adequate and capability, but also you have to pass a certain examination. Is that correct, sir? Just to be clear. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So there's a natural flow of attrition that some will be left by the wayside if they don't meet the grade, so to speak. That's correct, Mr. Chairman. Uh, another one, another one, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Yung sinasabi niyang demoralization, I think uh, people will understand. If the law is there, uh, makikita nila yung batas na yan, uh, the promotion system will be purely on merits at saka uh, fair ang level uh, 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 level ang playing, playing fields. So hindi pwede na nga, katulad ngayon, naghihintay na lang na, oy, paalis na to, abang na ako rito para mag-general ako. General ako ng uh, one year, then retire na ako. I think uh, this law, I think, is fair to all. Nagiging uh, pantas ang labanan dito. Kung hindi mo na kayang ma-promote sa, sa next na rank, aba, umalis ka na, na mag-retire ka na. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, is the chief of staff uh, raising his hand, General Gapa? Is that you? Or, uh, I'm not sure. Uh... Oh, this is Efren Abu. Uh... Yes, sir. Uh, chief of staff, sir. Chief of staff, uh, General Gapa, sir. Oh, yes. Sorry. Go ahead, Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead uh, General Gapa. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Your Honor, good morning. Uh, good morning to everyone. I am uh, General, Lieutenant General Gapay, sir, the Chief of Staff of the Armed Forces of the Philippines. May just a uh, comment on uh, regarding uh, putting a cap on the number of generals in the Armed Forces of the Philippines. Sir, uh, Admiral Marayag is right. Uh, we are governed now by uh, 86, uh, enacted last uh, 1996, uh, and it was uh, revised by uh, amended by Republic Act 9188 uh, in 2003, uh, prescribing uh, the number of generals uh, from 0.75% to 1.125 of the total strength of the armed forces. So, uh, and at the same time, uh, so right now, sir, uh, the cap of the number of generals is uh, based really on the on the actual strength both officer and ep enlisted personnel of the armed forces that's why it's it's uh, right now it's about uh, 200 sir and our fill up is at 181 uh, based on the directive of the dnd sir so uh, and right now it's uh, and based on the of the comments of uh, General Adan that uh, basing the number of generals on the actual table of organization and equipment of the armed forces also have, we find also merit on that, sir. That's why uh, what we recommend is uh, if we could marry, consider the TOE plus an amendment of uh, 9188 in uh, for the purpose of putting a cap in the number of generals of the armed forces, sir. So uh, I would like to say that uh, 
Armed Forces is a very dynamic organization and uh, it should remain responsive to current and emerging uh, security environment. That's why uh, we really cannot uh, uh, put a rigid uh, number as to the number of uh, general officers, but rather it should be dynamic also. So if you may suggest, sir, uh, because uh, 9188 is a 2003, series of 2003, uh, I guess it's uh, already time to revisit and amend the Republic Act 9188 and consider marrying that uh, formula of 1.125% uh, of the total strength of the armed forces and considering also the TOE, the Table of Organization Equipment of the Armed Forces, which uh, ranges uh, also, uh, Mr. Chair, Your Honor, from wartime to peacetime uh, organization. For example, uh, right now uh, we are at, we are uh, adapting a peacetime to conflict uh, size of organization at about 149,000, Your Honor. And uh, that is about 80% of our wartime TOE of about 180,000 strong. So uh, so we are also ad adopting a dynamic uh, TOE, uh, Mr. Chair, Your Honor. So if we, if we may propose, uh, we are proposing uh, to revisit and amend the Republic Act 9188, uh, marrying the TOE of the Armed Forces of the Philippines and the percentage, if only to put a cap on the number of uh, generals. And in that amendment, we could consider uh, the number of active officers instead of the total number of, uh, uh, the total strength of the armed forces, uh, Mr. Chair, Your Honor. The proposal is based on the number of active officers. That is not General De Villa's proposal. We can't agree with that. Aren't you saying the same thing? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, plus, plus also consider the TOE, the Table of Organization and Equipment. Because uh, right now, sir, at the basis of 1.125, uh, it remains uh, a question, sir, what is the basis? Why 1.125? Why not 1.5% or 2%? So we could uh, further rationalize that by uh, factoring in the table of organization equipment of the armed forces, uh, Mr. Chair, Your Honor. I remember in World War II in America, they were so grossly unprepared. It took General Marshall superhuman efforts to try and expand the American military in so short a time. I think they grew from a very measly 180,000 of memory service, correct, to almost uh, 7 million at the end of the war, if I'm not mistaken. And that took some doing, including the table of officers and equipment. So really, it really depends on the situation. That's what you're saying. I think we have to put on some flexibility uh, on the matter. And I think that would be left to the well. Uh, that might be left to the uh, 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 folks in the Joint Chiefs of Staff, as that's in the case of General George Marshall, where if situations demand it, they go to Congress right away, and they really lobby and play their fiddle because uh, the, the threat to the country is so great that we may have to increase our generals or even increase the armed forces and our equipment. Unfortunately, we tend to do it very late in the game when uh, the house is already burnt down uh, and the horse is already out of the barn. So it's important that I think that we have some measure of flexibility. The points are well taken. And if you'd like, you can come in with your position paper as well, a short one, so that we can understand it right away. Thank you. Yes, Dick. Thanks, Thanks, may I specifically request the Secretary of National Defense and the Chief of Staff of the Armed Forces of the Philippines to submit their position paper, particularly on this issue, because they seem not to be in agreement, uh, Mr. President, and, uh, and, the, uh, and therefore the burden is on us to really figure out which one is better, uh, a, a, a percentage of the uh, total active officers or the percentage of the total AFP strength. Uh, the first uh, proposal is favored by Secretary of National Defense and uh, proposed by Secretary de Villa. On the other hand, the Chief of Staff of the AFP appears to be uh, uh, not 
generally in favor of this. He wants a he wants more flexibility. So may may we request, uh, Mr. Chairman, for purposes of our committee report for the two gentlemen, the S uh, the S and D uh, and uh, the chief of staff of the AFP to give give us a written position paper only on this particular issue if this is necessary. And I would like to ask respectfully, Secretary De Rosana and uh, General, uh, the Chief of Staff of the Armed Forces, uh, to submit a, a position paper so we can be clarified. The rest of the committee can be clarified. That's the beauty of our democracy. Uh, ultimately, it will fall into the decision of the Congress of the Philippines to be able to make a determination. But again, the flexibility comes in depending on the circumstances of the time. Uh, I think everybody is agreed on that. We will comply, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any comments on the addition of uh, uh, to the Joint Chiefs of Staff? Uh, you know, uh, this was suggested by some of you. And uh, I think Cyber Command uh, is something that is very important these days. There is cyber warfare now. There's a specialized operation. But special operations units uh, uh, are also in fashion, especially in other armed forces. Uh, I don't think that it deserves to be in the uh, among the chairman, uh, among the joint chiefs of staff, uh, among the uh, uh, the officers covered. Uh, so, uh, what is your idea on the matter? Should we add the special operations command or cybersecurity command? Uh, oh, no. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, we are not in favor of that. I think what we will include in the uh, Joint Chiefs uh, are the three stars, which are the uh, Unified Command Commanders and the Service Chiefs. The uh, SOCOM, because the, the, the force of the SOCOM is uh, mostly, uh, as of now, this, the AP SOCOM is composed of the uh, Army SOCOM. I'm a First Navy, and uh, I, I, don't, I don't think this should be part of the Joint Chiefs, Mr. Chairman, and also the Cyber. Cyber Command is uh, still in its infancy, and uh, I, don't, I do not know yet how big is this uh, this is unit, so we will hold in abeyance uh, their uh, inclusion in the uh, uh, Joint Chief. Uh, in fact, right now, not even the Philippine Marines are included. No, sir. The Philippine Marine is part is uh, a part of the Philippine Navy. I know. Uh, I precisely put that in uh, to allow for discussion on whether this highly trained unit uh, should be part of it because it's part of the muscle of the armed forces and the Navy. Very little muscle in terms of its uh, assets. It's growing. Uh, certainly, we thought that... Uh, uh, it might spark some discussion. So, uh, you're in favor of keeping it in the pocket of the Philippine Navy and just limit it to the uh, Chief of Staff, uh, who's already the Joint Chief of Staff, a vice chair, and an Army, Navy, and Air Force. That, that is all. Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there any comments on that? Because uh, I agree with that. Quite frankly, I. Uh, uh, less people involved in the decision making who are all responsible because they now have uh, three years. Uh, th they now have three years uh, 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 in office, no? Uh, so I would imagine that they would have the kind of maturity that they would have uh, needed to do so. Uh, so uh, uh, if there are no comments on that. Uh, I'd like to go to another. Uh, what about our enlisted men and our, you know, master? Uh, uh, chiefs and our chief, uh, chief petty officers, or whatever you have, the non-commissioned officers. Uh, have you taken a look at that? Uh, uh, the uh, part in the law, because the retirement there would be 62, uh, except for the senior. Uh, yeah, uh, generally, it's years old for the enlisted. I think it's kind of old, quite frankly, because sometimes they cannot even carry their backpacks anymore. Uh, uh, when they when, when they are in a campaign, uh, uh, especially in the mountains. So I need your thoughts on this matter. 
uh, is it going to be uh, 36 years old or upon reaching 30 years of satisfactory service? Of course, there's always standard of the regular PTs that you exercise and the medical uh, checkups that you exercise regularly. Uh, we cannot uh, just say 56 is too old, but uh, I'd like your thoughts on that matter. Sir. Yes, sir. Uh, Secretary uh, Mr. Chairman, I think we should revisit that to, uh, I am now inclined to uh, favor 56 years old as the retirement of the uh, enlisted personnel. Um, anyway, Mr. Chairman, uh, we, we want a young army composed of uh, young soldiers. Now, recently there was a survey that was done in the Philippine Army and the average age of the battalions of the divisions are already 46 years old. Ang ibig sabihin, uh, we are not retiring uh, these peop uh, people fast enough to admit younger uh, younger soldiers. So if we can if we can implement strictly the time in grade tenure in grade, then uh, I'm sure uh, we will have we will stabilize the uh, the the rank and age of uh, young age of our soldiers. Thank you, sir. I quite agree with you, sir. Uh... We don't have a conscription here like they do in Korea, or they do in uh, Singapore, or they do in the Israeli military. Uh, at some point in time, uh, this is really part of a package, including ROTC. Uh, and maybe at some point in time, we may have to do some of that. I remember when I was a young uh, boy, not too very long ago, if I should say, uh, my father and Senator Jokno were talking to each other, and they said we should have something like uh, uh, service in the armed forces, uh, it's a great equalizer, uh, but that's something that we have to think about as well, uh, won't we? Uh, or, uh, is that something that we should think about? Uh, should we consider a big population? But uh, I think service to our country is something that is important. And the ROTC, of course, is the other part of that, uh, of the reforms that we need to do. Uh, sometimes when we talk about modernization, we only talk about assets. But we have to keep in mind that our young people, especially now, they're quite adept at uh, maybe cyber warfare. Uh, yeah. they, 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 they know very well how to operate computers and uh, how to even uh, hack uh, computers. So this is something that I think uh, some of you may be thinking about. So for the moment, uh, I, I quite agree uh, that uh, 50 sisters old should be retirement and uh, they have to uh, uh, they have to adhere to the attrition system. Uh, I'm in, uh, I'm in, uh, and I'm meaning to say that they have to pass exams and they have to be competent. What about the master sergeants uh, who represent the the enlisted men uh, in the armed forces? Do you think that we should uh, give them a separate retirement age, maybe 62, or they, shall we keep it at 56? I think 56 is also okay. So, oh, so the 56 is okay, Mr. Chairman. So 56 is okay. 56 is okay. Oh. Sir, 56 is okay with us, Mr. Chairman. 56 then. All right, sir. Uh, Senator Dillon, did you have a comment? Uh, uh, we're having trouble uh, because some people have their microphones open. Uh, please uh, do not, uh, press please do not talk while we're interrupting. <laughs> so we would like to, you to be conscious of that fact uh, and uh, please that, uh, make sure that you're conscious of the microphone keep your hands in your pockets if you're not going to speak uh, uh, so uh, we agree that 56 should be the proper age including the, non, the, the command master chiefs or the master sergeants uh, and uh, for the commissioned officers only for the 65 years old will only apply uh, to the chief of staff, uh, and the rest will be 62 years old. Is that my uh, understanding, uh, gentlemen? Yes. 62 years old. All the other yes. Please raise your hand so I can call you because you can't always speak at the same time. This is the new normal. Uh, <laughs> So, can you raise your hand, those in favor of 62, please raise your hand. 
<laughs> Ego, uh, the Secretary of Defense at the time, who else? Uh, uh, did I see uh, uh, the Chief of the, uh, the Superintendent of the Academy, uh, 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 Admiral Cusi, is that you? Or, uh, who's Lieutenant General Paredes? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't get your family name, sir. So what is it, um, uh, Mr. Secretary, Mr. Chairman? What? I think the Advisor is 62 years old for all generals and uh, 65 years old for the Chief of Staff. Uh, for the uh, enlisted personnel, we've been the 56 and 62? Yes, 56 times 56 po. 56 for those uh, with the rank of uh, uh, Master Sergeant and below, it is uh, 56. And for the senior non commissioned officers with the rank of senior Master Sergeant, it is 62. Is that uh, correct? The initial, uh, initial impulse is that, but uh, because we need the majority to represent the young men and women of the armed forces. Uh, I would imagine that they, they they should be entitled. They're not the. Uh, they can be 62. But uh, what is the pressure? Is it 56? Uh, uh, from what I gather, 56 is the agreement. We should not distinguish anymore. 56 uh, okay. is the agreement. Yeah, of course, uh, Mr. Chair. I do not know the budgetary implication, but uh, just to point out that there are indeed budgetary implications between 56 and 62. I am not prepared to say uh, whether it is burdensome or not. I'm just saying that there are budgetary implications. Let us leave it to the budget and let's talk about uh, really what is the quality for the armed forces as well today. So we're saying that everybody should retire at 56 for the enlisted personnel without distinction. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Actually, we invited the uh, Secretary of the Budget, but as we all know, in fact, I, I have forgotten my my questions. I was I, I was left over that yesterday, but uh, this is a very important piece of legislation, I think, that deserves uh, uh, the honor of the armed forces, I think, because uh, we, we are respecting the armed forces by putting this law in place. Secretary, Mr. Mr. do you have a comment, sir? Go ahead. Secretary De Villa, you're recognized, sir. Uh, please uh, <laughs> press the mute button. Uh, pre press the button so you can speak. Okay, yes. We can... Yes, Secretary. Secretary. Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. I'll address uh, you. I, 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 said, I suggested before during our conference that uh, the armed forces be directed uh, uh, to simulate the effects of this proposed law in terms of retirement and in terms even of the number of general officers. I do not know computer modeling to be certain, but uh, I'm sure that the armed forces can, uh, can uh, has the capability to simulate the effects of the proposed law, in so far as uh, the present database is concerned and personnel. And then we will know uh, uh, what will be the picture of the officer corps of the armed forces, especially with respect to attrition. And we will know the effect on the, on the personnel of the armed forces with respect to retirement at 56, retirement at 62. Uh, and so forth. Uh, I, I think a, a computer model can be designed to be able to predict uh, what will be the effect of this proposed law on personal management. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you. Uh, how would you propose uh, that we go about it? So, as the Secretary of Defense to do that? Uh, or shall we ask... Uh, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, we will uh, simply we will comply on that. We will submit the uh, simulation, sir. I certainly suggest that uh, by that, that next hearing, I think we will be able to have something that the fact because I don't want to be, I don't want this law to be delayed because we only have very few chances. In about a couple of weeks, we'll be already be taking the budget. We're already taking the budget right now. 
And I don't want uh, this call to be uh, stranded, Mr. President, Mr. Uh, Secretary. Would that be possible? Yes, Mr. Chairman. We will submit this up. I will direct the uh, two of staff to make the simulation immediately. Uh, yes, uh, staff. yes uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Your Honor. Uh, yes, sir, we will comply with that. In fact, uh, right now, we are uh, currently reviewing the TOE of the Armed Forces, identifying uh, positions and units that could be downgraded already from a star rank. Uh, commander to uh, colonel perhaps so we're in the process already uh, mr chair your honor and uh, we will submit as up uh, the requirement <coughs> there have been times in the past when i personally felt that our navy was really short uh short change uh, we had a four star uh we have a three star or even a four star in the navy that has no uh, that there's uh, hardly any assets, or for that matter, even our Air Force. Uh, that's why I think uh, we really all really have to be focused on uh, on uh, the positions as well as the TOE of the Armed Forces. Uh, I've always been a strong supporter of the, the Armed Forces. I think that uh, uh, they should be given the tools, uh, and uh, especially in this day and age where a lot of geopolitic, uh, political intramurals are going are ongoing and I think that we should be able to have the kind of officer uh, officers that we need to be able to help uh, uh, address the situation. Are there any other comments before I uh, go on? Uh, you've taken a look at the entire bill. bill. Uh, are we okay? Yes, sir. Yeah, General Farola, go ahead. Um, I, I was uh, reviewing my notes and um, going back to the constitutionality of uh, the issue raised by Senator Drillon. I, uh, I see in my notes that uh, when President Fidel Ramos extended Arturo Enrile, he did so on, on the following basis. Reading the position papers submitted by Chief Presidential Legal Counsel Rene Cayetano, as well as Secretary of Justice Tito Gingora, both explaining that the records of the Constitutional Commission deliberations on the subject indicated that the intention the intention of the framers to allow the chief of staff to serve beyond age 56, but yes. not exceeding a term of office of three years. Uh, this is what uh, I, I, I understand was the basis of President Ramos in extending uh, uh, the term of uh, Enrile. The papers of uh, the late Senator Cayetano and also Secretary of Justice uh, Tito Gingona. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I tend to agree with that, uh, uh, General, because I have here the records of the Constitutional Commission. And let me just uh, cite some of them. Uh, Mr. De Castro is speaking here. We have so provided that the tour of duty of the Chief of Staff is for three years, assuming that he is retirable at the age of 56. Assuming that tomorrow he will be 56 and today he is appointed or designated Chief of Staff, then he will have to finish his tour of duty and to include the exception, the continuation under the national emergency. This is one officer who will have to be an exception. Uh, Mr. Davide, who uh, was my contemporary in the CONCON and I was former Chief Justice said, in that respect, I would propose an amendment to read officers of the military except the Chief of Staff. Father Bernas uh, intervenes and says that probably is not necessary because it is taken care of by the paragraph we approved yesterday. Mr. Davide says that is correct, and Father Bernas goes on, and he says the understanding would be that the Chief of Staff must be allowed to finish his tour of duty, even if his service goes beyond 30 years or his age beyond 56 years of age. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. But uh, to be sure, I, we can always ask for an opinion from the 
maybe uh, the judge advocate or maybe the secretary of justice. I don't know. Uh, Senator Frank, what do you suggest? Uh, we we, uh, we should ask for a legal opinion from our Senate legal counsel. Uh, right. I don't think that the secretary of justice will issue an opinion uh, to the Senate because we are a separate branch. So, <laughs> so we, uh, we decide on this on the basis of our own interpretation, uh, Senator Gordon, that's my suggestion. Anyway, thank you. Is, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Uh, we will... Uh, we are to send it legal on here. By the way, who is our, our legal, is the legal counsel? I, I hardly, I hardly see him, I hardly uh, any interaction with him. Yes, there is. Uh, we have a legal counsel in the Senate. Right. In person. Uh, thank you, thank you, sir. Senator yeah. Andrile. Anyway, Mr. President, I think we have gotten uh, all uh, the views. My suggestion is uh, let the resource persons, uh, if they mind, are minded to, uh, to submit their position papers, uh, except for this uh, very sensitive issue on the uh, table of organization, uh, I would like to be clarified on that. And uh, we would suggest with your kind indulgence, Mr. Chair, that we give this priority, and uh, you know, we have. Uh, I think this is very necessary today, um, uh, so that we can sub we can put it on the floor uh, before uh, we uh, go on a break in October. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Okay. Uh, we could have another hearing next week uh, so that they can submit it, including all the uh, simulation as well as the uh, legal opinions. another hearing, Senator Gordon, position, written position papers, and let the technical staff uh, 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 propose committee amendments uh, on the committee report. And anyway, this is still subject to our review when we have our plenary debates. But just to expedite, I don't think that it's absolutely necessary to have another committee hearing. Just let our resource persons submit their position papers. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. That's my suggestion. Thank you very much for your support, uh, Senator sure. Frank, and uh, your wisdom. Uh, yes, uh, Sal uh, and the Dan, please go ahead. Yes, Mr. Chair, uh, <clears throat> may I also suggest that um, now that the uh, DND is tasked to undertake uh, simulation studies, to consider the issue raised by Admiral Marayag earlier uh, regarding the effectivity of this law, if it is passed, should there be a transition phase? Uh, <laughs> How should it be undertaken, you know, the implementation? Because the impact uh, that we're trying to avoid is uh, demoralization if, the, if there is no transition. So I, I just would like to suggest that that be considered the transition phase, if any. And uh, that, that could be part of the simulation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think it's important that the Secretary of National Defense has been very vocal about this and the Chief of Staff and all of you uh, you know, uh, start making some pronouncements and so that uh, uh, in case uh, there are certain things that they need to know uh, can be communicated to us. In the meantime, we will proceed the way Sec Senator Jordan has suggested uh, that should be considered in the uh, simulation, what you suggested, uh, uh, General Adan, and uh, I think that should be considered in the simulation. In the meantime, I would like to thank all of you. It's good to see all of you hail and hearty. Still, uh, uh, you know, uh, fighting hard. Uh, I must say that uh, I guess uh, we're looking at uh, some of the uh, officers that have always been seasoned and uh, have used their experience for uh, the country. And I thank you all for your service. Uh, uh, is there somebody raising up? Secretary Lorenzana, go ahead, sir. Mr. Chairman, uh, while we are here, let me just inject uh, not a matter not related to uh, this promotion. This is uh, in, related, in relation to the selection of cadets to enter PMA. It used to be that uh, um, application to PMA is by um, congressional district. In fact, when I entered the academy, I represented the lone district of Cotabato. But now it's already free, uh, free for all at large. So I believe that uh, the defense of our country should be also shared by all the regions of uh, the Philippines, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. 
Um, well, that, that's not a matter for this discussion, but I think it can be done uh, in another bill or by executive field. I don't know. I'm not sure. I'd be talking to my head if I did that. Uh, we will take that into consideration uh, in filing another bill if necessary. Uh, I would welcome you. Uh, I would welcome that, quite frankly. And also some suggestions, if I may. We're all done already here. I just wanted to uh, express my uh, my reservations at times. Uh, uh, we see people uh, having to repeat in the academy, and we just finished the medical scholarship bill, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, we don't take uh, uh, you know, uh, giving uh, resources to our cadets or, for that matter, our scholars in the in the in the medical profession, and only to flunk and uh, be turned back or what have you. Uh, I think that's important that once you get into the academy, uh, if you miss out on discipline, if you miss out on academics, then you know, like any other school, you'd have to uh, pay for your schooling and uh, be asked to leave. That's just a comment that I'm. Suggesting here, I don't know what you think about that, but I think uh, it's something that I think uh, has to be discussed. Yes, uh, Frank, Senator, Frank, go ahead. Yes, uh, Senator Dick, uh, I think we have gotten all the views, uh, yes. position papers to be submitted. Uh, we can, uh, we can uh, let the technical staff uh, 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 study the measure given all the inputs and uh, prepare the uh, committee report and uh, if there are no other matter i would move to adjourn to be able to move to the other committee hearing on finance uh, mr chair that is little i'm just trying to fish for ideas here uh, if you don't mind yes uh, yes, yes. No mind. I, I i always uh, I, it's a very rare occasion when you can have the best of the brightest uh best of the brightest of the military uh in our midst so just to uh, throw in some uh, for discussion it's not going to go anywhere but uh, i'd like to get some of your thoughts if not, then we will go as a suggestion. Are well, if, if we are going to to just uh, discuss a few things, may we get the views of our resource persons on this very difficult problem of the unfunded retirement yes. uh, <laughs> uh, 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 issue of our uh, armed forces? As we said, uh, this has been a constant burden, I mean problem, uh, because uh, indeed, uh, the uh, the modernization of the AFP is uh, uh, is uh, uh, meets uh, headwinds in the amount of funds that we have to devote for that we have to compulsorily uh, uh, allocate for our retirees. So there are I do not know what the solution is. There is a proposed solution uh, to uh, make our the retirement plan. Uh, fall under the GSIS, but the amount of money required for past service liabilities, I think, will amount to I don't know nine trillion, if I if I recall correctly. Uh, it's something that uh, could not be uh, afforded. The other one is uh, to uh, have a uh, law which will apply in the future. Uh, in other words, prospective application revising the retirement age, uh, applicable only to those who would enter the service at a certain date. So since, uh, Mr. Chairman, you would want uh, you want to pick uh, some the brains of our resource persons, I might as well uh, indulge in that activity and ask for the views of this very important issue on the retirement funds. Uh, to be precise, Mr. Pre uh, Mr. Minority Floor Leader, according to the latest actuarial study conducted by GSIS, if no reforms are introduced to the existing pension system, the seed fund shall require an amount equivalent to 5.5 trillion. Yes. 5.5 <laughs> trillion pesos. However, if reforms are implemented, specifically the deletion, the deletion of the automatic indexation feature. The formulation of a mandatory contribution and the designation of a minimum pensionable age, then the amount required for the seed fund is significantly lowered to two trillion. Still, malaki pa rin. <laughs> malaki pa rin. Uh, This is uh, the 2017 fiscal crisis statement. Perhaps it might have grown already, as you say, to nine trillion. Uh, I suppose that uh, we really have to. Uh, anybody want to want to comment on this? Uh, Things. Ed, Ed, Dan. 
please, your microphone, your microphone, unmute, please. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, our view as the retirees uh, is that um, any law uh, concerning the reduction of uh, what is uh, already uh, earned benefits <laughs> must apply only to the to those <laughs> incoming. No? Yeah, because because, uh, we have earned it. That, that, that's the general view of us retirees. But uh, if we analyze uh, again, again, taking the example of other countries' militaries, no? uh, in Australia, for example, the soldiers really pay for, uh, uh, they, they have, uh, they contribute no? to, their, to their pension, the British system, Australia, for example. And in other countries, although there, there will be, there is no indexation, the requirement of a retired military personnel, a veteran, like medicine, like medical uh, uh, assistance, Benefits. hospitalization is provided for. Uh, so, for example, their commissary system in the United States, retirees are allowed commissary system, and the, the prices are really very, um, very, uh, shall we say, very fair. Uh, the, the tax, uh, tax uh, free provision really benefits the veterans. So what I'm saying is, we really ask, what does a veteran need? What does a retiree need uh, uh, in exchange for the benefits given through indexation? A, a veteran needs hospitalization, medical care, and all that. Now, if there is a system that can provide for that, just like in other militaries, perhaps that demand uh, or, or need for a continuing indexation is is uh, decreased? No? Is uh, lessened? So you learn thoughts, Corito. What does a veteran need when he retires? Yeah, uh, Secretary Lorenzano, please. Mr. Chairman, there was already a proposed bill that uh, we crafted about two years ago. Uh, we consulted the uh, services because this uh, pension plan involves all the uniform personnel of the Philippines, like AFP, PNP, BGMP, uh, Coast Guard, uh, and some and one other, uh, Blue Corps. And uh, the plan was to monetize the real estate properties of the armed forces. But uh, we got a very bad feedback from the enlisted personnel because uh, of the effectivity of the law. Na pagkalag effect yun, tatamaan na yung nasa, nasa service na pumasok. So ayaw nila yun kasi ma, it will really uh, uh, reduce their uh, pension. So we are again um, re revisiting the, the bill na yung batas, it will take effect to people only during ya um apektuhan yung mga bagong pasok pag uh, napasa na yung batas i think it's now uh, in the uh, in the uh, office of senator bongo and uh, he will be presenting it soon mr mr chairman thank you i i shall hear uh, at the <laughs> consequences of this legislation that we are going to propose because hindi pwedeng walang aray diyan eh but anyway uh <laughs> I, I thought that we just get your thoughts. I, I'm glad Frank brought it up because uh, it's so important that we know uh, the prevailing winds and uh, how uh, the winds and storms of time will come up anytime we make some legislation. Thank you very much. Uh, if there are no more questions, uh, there's been a motion to adjourn. Uh, nobody's raising his hand. So uh, the session... Uh, Frank, do you mind if I suspend it, Mona, just to be sure, then we can adjourn? Okay, no problem. No problem. Right. Go ahead. Okay. I will, I will suspend it so that I don't have to call uh, for uh, a quorum later on. Uh, we have a quorum existing, so in case we call for another one, then we'll do so. All right. Uh, thank you all very much for coming. It's appreciated. Your thoughts are certainly uh, superlative thoughts that will help uh, craft a good bill. Thank you all very much, and God bless the Republic of the Philippines. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you.